this month we're really talking about this concept of Zen. Zen Buddhism is something that's really associated with martial arts strongly. You see it uh, in Japanese archery, Japanese sword, uh, karate, aikido. Uh, you see this idea of this meditative process though throughout the martial arts world. It's really almost like a hand-to-hand -hand thing. So where does this Zen idea come from and, and what are the concepts and what is its development? So we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, some of the history, kind of compressed, we'll get into too many details, but let's talk a little bit about this history of Zen Buddhism. So we have to go all the way back into antiquity and talk about India. It started to develop in India, and this is around the first century, and it starts spreading towards China, this idea of Buddhism and Buddhist thought. When it gets to China, it really starts to become accepted culturally, and it really starts to grow and have an influence over Chinese religion and over Chinese thought. So the Chinese have a meditative practice that they would call Chan meditation, uh, which would eventually become Zen, you know, a thousand or so years later. Um, around the 6th to the 8th century, uh, there's a gentleman named the Bodhidharma, or Bodhidharma, there's many ways to pronounce it. Um, he is the father of Shaolin Kung Fu. He introduces Kung Fu, this idea of a martial art, with its idea of the meditative process and marries the two things together. So it is that Shaolin influence that really starts to influence and impact martial arts in a major way into the future. It starts to migrate and works its way up into Korea, comes across the peninsula of Korea, and somewhere between the 6th and the 8th centuries, it's introduced from Korea into Japan. When it gets introduced into Japan, it starts to grow there first slowly, and then eventually Chan-style meditation becomes Zen-style meditation. And the Zen is really heavily influential during the samurai period specifically the time frame of the Kamakura period in Japan. You really start to see this adoption of Bushido and the martial arts where in there also utilizing this idea of Zen meditation. So on our next section, we're gonna talk a little bit about the physiologic impacts of appropriate meditative process of Zen meditation and how it can relate to the warrior. You know, the, the Japanese talk about the three pillars of Zen Buddhism. The first pillar is just daily discipline and that you practice. The second pillar is that through that practicing, you begin to develop proficiency. So practicing equals proficiency and proficiency will eventually lead to enlightenment. Uh, the enlightenment is this idea of satori, the enlightened mind. So now you can begin to see, well, that might be an important thing for a warrior to be in the present all the time, to have a heightened sense of awareness, to have this ability to calm himself in mortal combat through utilizing some of these meditative uh, practices through Zazen meditation. So let's move on to the next section, which is gonna be an introduction of some of the concepts of Western medical pathophysiology to the Zen process. we're going to talk about biology. So this is going to be meditation, biology 101. So when we talk about the biology of breathing, if I were to ask you, what are the stages of breathing? Most of you are going to tell me two. Uh, we inhale and we exhale. Okay, I buy that. That's true. In the meditative process, there are four stages. We inhale, we pause, we exhale, and we pause. When I talk about the biological effects of that, those, those effects are huge. Our body, the human body, and really any biological system, likes to maintain a state of constant equilibrium. That is called homeostasis. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm laughing because I'm, I'm picturing my, one of my, one of my uh, students who teaches at our school in Abingdon has a very heavy Southern accent. So I'm picturing him saying homeostasis. Uh, but anyway, I digress. We tend to try to stay in this state of constant equilibrium, and it's through our breathing. If we go back into antiquity and go to India, it was really there where they first identified that there was this idea of a mind and a body connection, right? Where we could control our breathing. And if you think about it, 
If I'm a five-year-old and you take away my cookie, I can get angry with you and I can hyperventilate. Or I can get angry with you and I can choose to hold my breath. And if I'm angry enough, I can hold my breath until I literally pass out and fall down on the floor unconscious. What happens then? Well, the autonomic nervous system kicks in, you start to breathe again, and you wake up. So you kind of have this dual hard wiring within your human body that you can control some of your breathing aspects, and some of it's automatic. It's pretty cool, right? When we exhale, we're exhaling carbon dioxide. When we inhale, we're breathing in oxygen, okay? That's really important. When we exhale, we're talking about getting rid of a metabolic waste product that is carbon dioxide. There are really four ways that we get rid of uh, waste products. What the Orientals might call, or the Japanese stylists would call misogi, body purification, right? Um, typically, body purification comes in four ways. We can urinate, we can defecate, we can sweat, and we can exhale and get rid of carbon dioxide. The Misogi concept adds in yet a fifth parameter of this, which is this idea of clarifying the mind, of getting rid of uh, stressful things, of bad moments, of being able to relax the mind, to clean the mind in a way that relates to Misogi meditation. And how do we get there? Through Zen meditation. So that's the idea of mind and body connected as one. Getting back to the biology of this though, if we think about what's happening within the brain while we meditate, when we go to sleep, we have different stages of sleep, right? Um, in the sleep process, what we want to reach is this idea of restorative and reparative sleep. <clears throat> That's the sleep wherein if I hook an EEG, an electroencephalograph to you, um, I can look at your brain wave patterns and they'll literally change as you get into deeper and deeper sleep. You'll go through delta and theta wave sleep. Different things biologically happen. Instructors, you don't need to know all this, but it's good to be familiar with it. Um, where you have the releases of natural hormones. Human growth hormone is released. Um, serotonin levels can go up when you're in deep sleep. And typically when we're sleeping, if we can get two to three hours of really good restorative and reparative quality sleep, we feel pretty good the next day. The meditative process, that mind-body link, can get us to that level of restorative and reparative processes quicker, and it can be just as efficient as a really good night's sleep. Instructors, why wouldn't we want to teach our students how to do this? You know, so many times I hear all traditional martial arts, you know, it's, it's lost its application. Well, we're gonna talk about applicability in the next section, and I'm gonna get into the weeds on applicability uh, from the standpoint of being able to stay calm, and I'm gonna present that from the standpoint of an army colonel who served in combat lots of times, and my primary job in combat was trauma medevac. So we'll get into why this is such an important thing when we talk about emergency situations where you have to defend yourself or you have to think under stress and duress. But it is the other affects of the meditative process and Masogi body purification that instructors is so vital and it's so important. And it's such an overlooked aspect of martial arts. I think it's really one of the most important aspects of martial arts that we can have is this idea of this physical well being that we can get through the meditative process. Um, blood pressure comes down, heart rate comes down, focus improves. Uh, we have the release of human growth hormone from the brain. We have serotonin levels that can go up. You know, even people who aren't involved in martial arts, Arnold Schwarzenegger is a famous bodybuilder. Arnold meditates 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the evening. Why did Arnold do that? Well, he did it because he identified that through the meditative process, he was much better able to perform on stage because he could keep himself calm and focused while he was going through his poses. Hey, I wear a gi and a hakama, so I can't imagine being up there in a set of bikini boxers and posing. That would be very distracting and make me nervous as hell. I mean, you probably wouldn't want to see that. So bottom line is for my instructors, guys, if you don't include meditation on a regular basis with your classes, you really should include it in every class so that at least when the student walks out of there, they're like I was years ago, June Reed, when I was just a little guy, I was maybe 10 years old, I remember I asked him, I said, Master Reed, why do we always sit quiet for like three or four minutes at the end of every class and meditate? 
And Master E said, because it's good for you and it's important. So meditation, guys, take it from Master E. It's good for you and it's important. In the next section, we're gonna talk about applicability. This is section three on meditation and the meditative process. So in this section, we're gonna talk about applicability. We've talked originally just kind of introducing the history of it. Then we talked a little bit about some of the biology of what happens when you're in this deep meditative state. We introduced the concept of uh, Zen meditation, also of Nisogi body purification. Now we're gonna talk about applicability. When we talk about the applicability I go back to my days as a flight doc in school down at Fort Rucker in Fort Rucker, Alabama. Uh, one of our teachers, who was one of the senior instructors for the flight surgeon course, one of the first classes that he taught, he said, you know, in medicine, we learn to check our own pulse first. That's a really important concept. If you think about it, if I'm leading a code and I'm worked up and I'm not focused and I'm not really in that moment, then the patient's gonna suffer. As the team leader on a code, you're calling the shots. You've got to be focused. You've got to lead. You have to be active in your thoughts and be squared away in your approach to that emergency. Well, meditation really helps you to be able to do that. In combat, we teach soldiers what's called combat breathing. Combat breathing is where we teach even the youngest recruits, the youngest privates, all the way up to even me before I retired, an old colonel. Um, we teach combat breathing. It is a way to, um, I had a sergeant one time put it this way. He said, it's how you control your role. And it's so true. What happens in group think, a lot of times one person gets worked up and he works up the next person and pretty soon everybody's riled up and nobody is really in control. I've seen this on medevacs where I have multiple patients in a helicopter and we're trying to fly out of an area uh, in Iraq or Afghanistan or Bosnia, Kosovo, Hurricane Katrina, take your pick. I, I did evac missions and combat missions in all of those places. Um, if one guy gets nauseated and starts throwing up, guess what? The next guy does, the next guy does. And by the time you get back as the flight doc, I've got vomit all over my boots. That's just sort of that not being able for them to control their role, to be able to slow down that nausea, to be able to get within their head and slow things down, that uh, meditative state that's so important. Most of the time, guys, when we talk about why did you get into martial arts to begin with, it was because I wanted to learn to defend myself, right? At some point, that learning to defend yourself takes a second seat, third seat, and in my case, I've been doing this 55 years, it's like up in the balcony somewhere. Uh, for me, this is a sort of my process of what it is that I do. But at some point, you begin to realize there's a lot more to this process. And this meditation and the Sogi and body purification are so important. In a self-defense setting, we go through an adrenaline-based response. In that adrenaline-based response, our heart rate goes up, our respiratory rate goes up, our ability to control our fine motor movements goes down. So it's greatly reduced because we're in an emergency, we're under stress and duress, right? If I go through the three pillars of the meditative process and I practice them daily to where I have had practice, lots of it, I am now slowly becoming the second P, proficient at what it is that I do, that I can reach that meditative state rather quickly, then I'm over here with this idea of a calm mind, what the Japanese might call satori. We might just simply call it focus. Your ability to focus in an emergency setting whether it's popping a chest tube into a screaming Marine in the back of a Black Hawk helicopter, or it's dealing with some young kid jumping out of the pickup truck trying to grab you, you pivot to a finger lock, take him to the ground, and explain to that youngster why it was probably a bad idea to pick on a white-haired uh, martial arts instructor. It's another story for another time. The bottom line is, when we are able to control our mind, we can control our body. The window to do that is through breathing and through the breath process that we learn through Zazen meditation. Those things all relate to this Japanese concept of the five areas that we can purify through Misogi. 
Body purification and meditation are really one. It is the Zen meditation process that allow us to respond to emergency situations rapidly, effectively, and to be able to control what's going on around us in a manner that would allow us to control our mind. If we let our mind go off willy-nilly, we've lost the battle, guys. So that's uh, this discussion of applicability. If you want to read more about some of these things, as far as my history, um, there's a couple of books out here. Uh, Rush to Danger by Ted Barris is a book that talks about uh, medics in the line of fire. Um, and I'm featured in the book and tell some of my stories about doing some things on medevacs and things like that that are, are uh, emergent and sort of adrenalized and, and how meditation really kind of helped me to stay calm and to focus and to do things in an environment that was difficult. Um, this other book is something I'd recommend for instructors. If you guys haven't looked at this, it's The Empty Cup. It's a proper mindset for successful training in martial arts. This was written by my friend Jeff Webb. Uh, Jeff is a Ving Sun Gong Fu practitioner. Uh, if you look on the back, just for full disclosure, you will see Colonel Dana S. Harden, Senior Flight Sergeant, the U.S. Army. Um, I do, of course, recommend the book. I have no monetary gain from this, but this is just a good book. It's full of Zen koans or useful stories that help to teach a student this idea of some centered mor moral or morality that we try to get through the martial arts. We're all walking this path together, this do. Meditation, misogi, the studies of Zen. Guys, in the next section, we're actually going to look at the meditative process and how to do it. Hi guys, so we've reached the final part of the video, which is the actual process of meditation itself. For my instructors out there, when you're teaching this to your students, you really have to emphasize structure. They have two options for positions. Uh, the first one that my son used to call it crisscross applesauce or sitting bull position, but we call it anza in Japanese martial systems where the legs are crossed or folded. The other is the more classic style that you'll see often done in Zazen meditation, which is the seiza position. So seiza, we try to give our homage back to the samurai origins, our swords on our left side. So when we go down into seiza, we will start in this shizentai, just a natural stance. I'm going to squat and my left knee, right knee, toes go out. And then to assure that I have a good triangular base, I want to go one, two, three fists apart so that my knees are fairly wide. My hips, shoulders want to line up so that my spinal column is nice and straight. And I tell students to visualize a small string that attaches to the top of my head and is pulling their head upward so that their shoulders are nice, straight, and excellent posture. What do we do with our hands? During the meditative process, palms should be up, resting so that the muscles of the shoulders don't contract. I like to put my thumbs together. Sometimes you'll see this position, you'll see knuckles together in um, shinobi, uh, the ninjutsu styles. You'll often see those guys do finger weaving technique while they meditate. We're not gonna get into all of that. We're gonna go through a couple of cycles of the meditative process. The mechanics of this are they breathe in through their nose. When they breathe in, they wanna feel the air going down the back of their spine and they wanna move their tummy in and out. So they're belly breathing. Um, something that I learned at a seminar up in Philadelphia with a gentleman named Seiichi Sugano, Steve Sugano, um, was this idea of rocking my body back and forth. And uh, Sugano Sensei talks about how that gives you something to feel. And later on, we'll add in what's called kotodama or kototama, which is sound. Uh, in, in the martial speak, there is a universal sound that is called u or su. And you'll see that it's written about frequently in Buddhist texts. Uh, and again, this is not about a religious process. This is more about a meditative process that's going to help you to deal with life better and to help you to relax. Towards the end of the video, I'll add in that Su method along with the rocking. So now what we're doing is we're occupying our brain with this idea of the four-step method. Inhale, pause, exhale, pause, back is straight. Breathing in through the nose, down the spinal column, belly breathing to get good oxygenation, body rocking back and forth so that now your brain is feeling movement like an ocean wave. And then this sound that you're making, the ooh sound, which we'll do later, 
um, gives you then something to hear. All right, so if I turn this sideways, again, triangular position, palms up, shoulders back straight. I prefer in this position to close your eyes. And typically for a new student, if you're doing this as a beginner, two, three minutes as a max is really all you need to do. If you get into three and four minutes, uh, it's really a very advanced practitioner that does 20, 30 minutes of this. So I'm just going to go through, talk my way through two cycles. Then I'll show you two cycles and then we'll add in the sound for two cycles. Okay. So posture, breathing in, focusing on the nose, mouth is closed. Pause. Mouth is open. Exhale. Pause. That's one cycle. When I close my eyes, I'll go through two standard cycles. That's two basic cycles. I'm now going to add in the rocking motion to this, the Sugano method. I'll turn sideways so that you can see. Okay, so now the last is adding in the idea of kototama. Kototama is this Japanese principle of power in sound. In Western medicine, you know, we use ultrasound to diagnose problems. Uh, sound is starting to be something that's researched heavily in the treatment of multiple problems, multiple issues. Some people feel that it stimulates the hypothalamus to release uh, things like serotonin, uh, human growth hormone, things that are very good for us. So. With the sound, kotodama, ooh, eyes closed, posture straight, proper triangle position, hands relaxed so that you don't have to worry about what they're doing. Okay, that's four cycles with the sound with the Kotodama. Very relaxing. Um, guys, I hope you have enjoyed this video on meditation, on Zazen, and on this Zen process. 
try to inculcate this into your programs, teach your students, whether they're doing Karate Do, Aikido, Kendo. You see Zen throughout nearly all aspects of Japanese life. Over my shoulder, I have a Sumei ink brush painting that was done for me in Japan by a 90 plus year old Aikido master who was a direct student of O Sensei's. Um, and in Sumei, it's this idea of Ichigo Ichiai. One encounter, one chance. He dips the brush in the paint, and if black ink falls on that rice paper, well, it falls on the rice paper, right? It is what it is. And they do all this in one stroke. They try to start from the top, work their way to the bottom, and it's very zen. Ikebana, flower arranging, utilizes the same principles of zen. So it's not just about samurai and sword fighting or Aikido and tossing people. Zen is something that can be utilized in every aspect of your life. And certainly this meditative process is very healthy, it's very relaxing, it's de-stressing, and in this day and age, any way that you can de-stress your life is probably a good thing. Um, I'm Dane Harden with Dane Harden Martial Arts on YouTube. I hope you've enjoyed this deep dive into this idea of Zen and Zen meditation. Please like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time on Dane Harden Martial Arts on YouTube. Thank you so much for watching.